Uh, thank you so much for everybody for coming. We were just waiting for uh, one of our panelists who um, I think is at the door. But I think we can start and then she can join. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, sorry about that. Uh, <clears throat> thank you once again. My name is Asad Beg, and um, this particular session is being hosted by Media Matters for Democracy. Uh, it's a Pakistan-based not-for-profit organization which is working on research and advocacy, primarily focusing on free expression and media freedom in Pakistan. Uh, I myself is a, I'm a journalist and also the founder of Media Matters. Uh, and what today we wanted to speak about in general and in specific as well, was how online information is evolving, specifically in uh, South Asian countries. And what are those policies and solutions uh, which are being posed as good ideas and uh, uh, interventions as, uh, uh, as, as something to push back on this menace and whether or not they're working. I won't go into a lot of detail right away but very quickly, we have four uh, panelists today, including myself. I'm going to moderate the session. And uh, for each panelist, we have about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, we have somebody from Facebook coming as well, but they couldn't participate, So, uh, which means we have slightly more time for uh, the audience engagement. Um, we have about 25 minutes for an open discussion, uh, more or less 25 minutes. It can be more or less, depending on uh, the presentations of the panelists. <clears throat> Excuse me. So before I go into um, opening the session formally, if I may request the panelists sitting on my either side to introduce themselves quickly. Sorry. Let me. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Rosalind kratoch Moore, and I work for Deutsche Welle Academy. And uh, I work in the strategy and consultancy department, and my remit is media and information literacy, and I'm responsible for developing our um, initiatives regarding media and information literacy um, and um, looking at both our internal and external kind of approaches in, in this regard. And that's what I'm going to talk a bit about uh, later. Good morning. Uh, my name is Poor Hughes. I'm the legal director at an organization called Media Legal Defense Initiative. We litigate cases around the world relating to freedom of expression, press freedom in particular, and then freedom of expression more broadly before international and regional courts. And this topic, I guess, is relevant for us because we are involved in litigation in relation to legislation that's introducing fake, false uh, laws um, all around the world. Uh, thank you, and I've already introduced myself. One particular uh, output or, or, or sort of a, an idea that uh, I want to have from this discussion today, and this is mainly for my own personal agenda, if, uh, if you would call it, is to, is to sort of see how this uh, subject of misinformation is not really something which we could put a binary solution to, a black and white model which can be both sort of, you know, take care of that and so, because this is the kind of solution which is being offered in most of the South Asian countries, including Pakistan. You have misinformation online, create a law for that, get Facebook to remove the content, we are done, bam, that's it, the end of it. You have misinformation online and you create a cyber crimes law through which you can criminalize whatever is being said and you put the people in jail and that's the end of it. So this, this kind of binary model, which we usually see working in uh, some, most of the South Asian countries and now even the, some of the, the Western world, my personal sort of um, idea was to kind of debunk that through discussion today and how that black and white binary model is perhaps not the solution. Anyway, so we have the fourth panelist here. Uh, Ishara, thank you so much for joining us. <coughs> Excuse me. If you can uh, very quickly introduce yourself and then we can move on to the panel's presentations. Hi, good morning everyone. 
Uh, I'm Ishara Dhanasekar from Sri Lanka. I'm representing the Center for Policy Alternatives, which is an NGO working on the policies, uh, democracy, and the reconciliation in the country. And we are representing the media unit of the uh, Center for Policy Alternatives, which uh, uh, include three main languages, uh, Sinhala, Tamil, and English platforms, and I'm working in the local language Sinhala as the co-editor of Vikalpa website, and we have two more websites, Ground Views and Madram, uh, which works in Sinhala, uh, Tamil, and English. Thank you. Uh, so we'll have the first presentation from Ishara, but before that, very quickly, uh, talk. I'm, I'm going to talk a little about misinformation as I see it. So the World Economic Forum, as um, most of you would know, has categorized it as one of the biggest threats to the human society. And you know, why is that, if one would think? In 2016, not a very long um, time ago, the defense minister of Pakistan, who, by the way, is also in, in some way uh, the lead of uh, the army of Pakistan, and the whole of the defense sector, which also includes weapons development and so on, tweeted in response to a supposedly fake statement from the former Israeli minister. And his tweet was essentially a nuclear threat to Israel. And that was, uh, that was in response to a fake statement, which is being circulated by a certain out output called uh, AWD News. And this statement, of course, was picked up by all of the mainstream media without, without the basic decency or common sense of getting it verified from anywhere. And after a, a couple of days when, when the local media was exhausted airing this news over and over again, they found out that this, this tweet was essentially a fake tweet or fake statement. And that the original information ministry of Israel tweeted about, and they said that this, this was a completely fake statement. This never happened. So this is the kind of extent we are talking about. Uh, we, we are not talking about morphed images anymore. We are talking about nuclear threats. <coughs> Excuse me. Later, we found out, uh, and there was a news report in October of 2018, that that AW News outlet was a part of a larger campaign being run on Facebook. And most of that campaign could be linked through, allegedly linked through sources in Iran. And so this is the kind of threats that we are talking about misinformation. When we talk about misinformation, this is what, or disinformation, this is what we are looking at. <clears throat> Similarly, in India, we've seen that there, there are many cases of lynching now which can be linked to rumors or disinformation, as we call them. Very recently in Pakistan, there was a, in, specifically in Islamabad, there was a huge religious protest. I'm sure many of you must have heard about that. And it was in response uh, to a certain decision which came out of the Supreme Court. And during which there were many, many documented cases of, uh, of uh, uh, misinformation which was directed at people who were trying to suppress that, law enforcement agencies, calling for direct violence, calling for lynching in public, calling for hangings in, in public, and so on. And all of these items were, of course, based on the information which was completely unreal, which was fake. Uh, so what we are now talking about is weaponizing misinformation. It's not just about a tweet. It's not just about a poster. It's about using it as a weapon, especially when it has a religious and political undertone. <clears throat> Uh, we've done some research in, in terms of elections before uh, the election and so on. I'll, I'll move on to that in, on, uh, uh, you know, in, in more detail in my presentation. I'm going to skip that for now. Now the newest trend what we are looking for is artificial, artificially intelligence, uh, I'm sorry, artificially intelligent images which are being created through algorithms and applications. There is this new thing which uh, we very recently got to know about, which is generative adversarial network. GNA, as, uh, uh, GAN, I'm sorry, as it calls, which apparently what it does is it takes, uh, you feed it pictures and it learns your face and it creates a fake picture, which is actually none of those pictures, it's, it's a new picture, but it's, it's a total fake. It's, it, it's not there. And similarly, it's creating videos. So the fake videos, porn videos of celebrities online now has become a big thing, which, and these videos never happened, of course, but if you look at them, you'll find out how real they are. Uh, and then there are 
similar ways to push back on it. You know, people keep coming up with their own algorithms to push back and identify these networks. But, you know, if somebody works on AI, you would know that it's very easy for AI to evolve. So, for instance, one of the things that they were able to identify in these videos is that the fake people don't blink. It's, you know, it's as simple as adding one line into the algorithm that you have, you know, make them blink. And then the whole model of verification that you have, it bans it, it's, it's done. So it's as simple as that when we talk about artificially created uh, fake videos and images. <clears throat> Excuse me. For me as a journalist, it has a huge impact on journalists and journalism, or at least in Pakistan as we've seen it. Because most of these videos, most of these uh, images are being circulated through fake websites, which are created in the name of famous journalists. They have absolutely nothing to do with them. Uh, not only that these websites are actually making money out of advertising, but they're also using these fake videos as clickbaits. So every time you go on Twitter, you see that you know, XYZ, credible journalist, who also, by the way, hosts a talk show on a primetime television, is saying that, oh my god, a porn video of you know, XYZ person was released. You, people are bound to click on that because it's coming from a face they're very, uh, they, they, they're very accustomed to hearing these things. <laughs> only the problem is that all of this information gathering generation model, it's completely fake. It has nothing to do with the person whose picture is being used here. <clears throat> and fact-checking, I'm sorry I'm taking a lot of time, but just wrapping up, just to give a context of the conversation we are having today. And the fact-checking is in chance. You know, people like myself, journalists, tend to put their faith in the mainstream media outlets. But, you know, it has turned out that the misinformation or disinformation like this is even is becoming profitable for the media houses. Because many times we see when something like this pops up, it gets reported in the media, primarily because it generates TRP for them. You know, two days later, they're, it's very easy for them to come and say that, oh my god, it was fake, and I'd be sorry about that. Most of them don't even say that. In one year, we have seen many, many cases of fake tweets, people uh, impersonating other people, and these tweets getting reported by the mainstream media, television channels, newspapers, on the website. Some of them are still online, by the way, the news reports that they've created based on. So then if, if people like me put their faith in media organizations for fact-checking, even that is in chance. <clears throat> Just one last thing. As a response of all this, we've seen new laws and new policies and new initiatives and new models coming up. How useful are that models? That perhaps is one thing that we want to focus today. We've seen laws, so for instance, we've seen a law in Germany. Uh, you know, how useful that is. We've s seen similar models getting inspired in Pakistan, um, and I'm sure in other South Asian countries as well, where they're talking about cross-regulation, which is to regulate the social media platform alongside, with the same code and law, alongside the mainstream media. I don't know even how that's possible. How, how can you even compare the two? But apparently, governments are thinking about it. And then we, specifically in Pakistan, we have a government-funded information, uh, ministry-funded, operated fact-checking thing. So governments are now actually stepping into fact-checking. And so then, who, is, who in the government is prepared to define what is uh, fake news, as they call it, or what is misinformation? So anything, is it also that, that anything that is politically irrelevant, or uh, I'm sorry, politically critical of them, is, has become uh, uh, or, uh, misinformation and dis disinformation for, for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pretty much like CNN is fake news for Trump. So, so these are the kind of things and these are the kind of responses which we have seen. How useful are they? This is something we are going to talk about. Um, I'm going to stop here, and Shara, if I may request you to uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, share your presentation and your experience of working in Sri Lanka and uh, monitoring and so on. So, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for giving me this opportunity. I know it's, though it's the last minute, uh, I'm grateful for you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, when I'm uh, coming from a very crisis situation right now, so to understand uh, how and why fake news has been such a persistent problem in Sri Lanka, I think it's uh, necessary to understand a little bit about the political context in our country. So let me start like this. Now, right now, the current situation in Sri Lanka, 
There's a no-confidence motion which was signed by 122 MPs in Parliament after 20 days of assignment in the Parliament by unconstitutionally by the President and today the Parliament was held after 20 days. So right now there's a lot of uh, uh, ongoing misinformation in social media that uh, this no confident motion where these uh, signatures are being replaced and the dates are being replaced and a lot of uh, this uh, information are being disseminated through the Facebook and Twitter and like a lot of social media apps right now at the moment I'm talking to you. So and these uh, huge campaigns are run by the uh, the previous regime, the political regime, and this misinformation are being disseminated to the public by public figure, figures. So people tend to believe them, and there's a risk of that because, like, uh, they they think uh, they think that the these information which are being uh, circulated around are true and accurate, and it seems true. So that's a kind of situation right now in Sri Lanka. So I speak in a situation like that. So first of all, uh, before I start, I would like to uh, address the polit context of Sri Lanka in two ways. One is the we are a divided country right now, and we have a democratic deficit right now. What I call a divided country, Sri Lanka is still recovering from nearly three decades of civil war that among there are other issues along lines of language and land, ethnic politics, education, and employment. And this has showed a deep and enduring divisions between the majority Sinhalese and the minority Tamils in the country. So for decades, politicians have deliberately pandered the Sinhala majority and community and their needs in order to gain political power and the mileage from as back as 1956 when Prime Minister S.W.R.D. Bandaranaika passed the Sinhala-only Act in Sri Lanka, which made Sinhala the official language of administrative service. Still it is. And the runoff of election, politicians, news outlets, and the social media have all put out information designed deliberately to mislead. So why I call uh, it is a democratic deficit? So to bring out an example, there was an island-wide uh, survey conducted by the Center for Policy Alternatives in 2016, and it uh, paints a distressing land care for the democratic institution and processes in Sri Lanka. So only 13.2% of Sri Lanka has a great deal of trust in the parliament. And surprisingly, while 365 of Sri Lankans have no trust in the parliament, so exactly half of those polls say they, they don't trust political parties at least, and that is in the least. So in March 2015, uh, the wave of the polls, 16.2% uh, indicate that they trusted the election commission. But when it comes to 2016, end of 2016 February, it has go down to 54.8. And surprisingly, if I ask you today, I don't know how people will react. There will be a zero. Because with the things going on, it has changed drastically within a few years. So coming back uh, again, like uh, during the 2015 uh, presidential election, then President Mahinda Rajapaksha was accompanied to polling station by another presidential, presidential candidate called R.A. Sirisen, who is incidentally bears a striking resemblance to the current president. And, uh, and was wearing a white national suit that Sirisen habitually wears. So it's like a resemblance of the same uh, person who is going to context. So afterward, Mahinda Rajapaksha said to the press, Sirisen even accompanied me to the polling station. So which is uh, like irony. But a clear attempt to mislead voters to believe that the joint opposition candidate had decided to endorse himself instead. So one month before, uh, there was also an uh, ad play uh, ad on the newspapers uh, that uh, this fake uh, resembles promising the abolish, uh, promising of the abolition of the executive presiden presidency where uh, Sirisen also promised us in the presidential election in 2015. So in the election campaign itself, uh, Rajapaksha made use of more than 150 social media accounts running deliberately campaign disinformation and misinformation against his opponents. 
And also, a report released again by the Center for Al uh, Policy Alternatives uh, called Saving Sunil, a study of dangerous speech around a Facebook page dedicated to uh, Sa Sa Sergeant Sunil Ratnaika. It says that uh, the discourse on Facebook around the murder conviction of Staff Surgeon RM Sunil Ratnaika on Sri Lanka Army uh, found guilty on murdering eight civilians, including a five-year-old child in Jaffna in 2015. While four other defenders were released due to lack of evidence, the verdict against Sergeant Ratnaika was de delivered by the day before uh, the parliament was dissolved by President Citizen in June 15, 2015. So calling for general election. So this Facebook page, which had 16,000 followers, 11,000 of them uh, were from the first day since the page was set up. So was politicized and used as a campaign platform uh, which uh, peddled the hardline rhetoric advocated by the former Mahindra Rajapaksha, which promised to protect and safeguard the military. So the administrators of Facebook page praised certain Ratnayaka as a war hero and used name depicting the many struggles and sacrifices faced by soldiers, leading to emotive responses and hate speech against the directive or who they are. Uh, question this version of events. So this is a reflection of the veneration of the military which translate uh, relative impunity. And also, the, uh, it's interesting to know that the, this report also called police statics to affect the 20% of Sri Lankans, fa Sri Lankan Facebook accounts out of total 1.2 million in 2012 were fake. So, and also in a survey conducted in June 2015 by Center for Policy Alternative in the Western province, the most connected part of the country to social media, uh, says that uh, they would like to take upon seeking something online and 61% of those people that action was sharing it with friends and family explaining how uh, fake news can spread so quickly. It can speaks to relatively how low media literacy uh, the ability to critically engage with the media, despite the relative high literacy level in Sri Lanka. So, and with the recent incidents we had in 2014, 17, and 18 regarding the communal violence, uh, which, uh, if I come by go by the incidents, uh, which is to in 2014, it's Aludgama where uh, Muslims were attacked, and then in 2017, uh, uh, where uh, some in Dintota, the down south of Sri Lanka, where again the Muslims were attacking, and in 2018, where huge Muslim houses, mosques, and like shops were attacked in Kandy, in Digana, and as well as in Ampara. So, these communal violence also led uh, kind of through Facebook fake news and mis misinformation, which uh, had a systematic way of spreading. Because I told you there's a clear division in the country uh, with the communities right now. And also, uh, there was an interesting uh, the situ uh, incident again in Sri Lanka, what happened. Like, uh, it also not only in Facebook, but it also directly in uh, papers, newspapers as well. I mean, renowned re newspapers as well, and news agencies. So one of the examples <coughs> is like, uh, uh, there was a uh, recent example on a story of a blood donation and which saw a leading de uh, daily paper. I, won't, I, I didn't want to uh, name the paper. So it quotes the director general of J Jaffna Teaching Hospital saying that members of the upper caste were refusing to donate blood uh, for the fear it would be given to patients of a lower caste. So that kind of a story was ongoing, which is a very a misinformative one. So, uh, and there were another examples. Of, there were a lot. There are a lot of examples that are upcoming in Sri Lanka with the situation uh, ongoing. So, I, I would like to conclude myself, like uh, in this kind of an environment, like as a civic media team. So, as a trilingual platform, uh, we we active in Sri Lanka. So, there is a question: is how we counter these fake news because we know like a lot of media stations or a lot of uh, major uh, news uh, outlets in Sri Lanka are owned by a um, lot of politicians or there, there's a backing uh, factor in them. So there's a risk, how, there's a risk how we 
uh, go back and counter these fake news or misinformation uh, spreading. So as a team, like uh, we engage in combating this uh, uh, misinformation and maintaining a quality in reporting in our websites and ensuring that stories are collaborated by multi multiple so sources, backing up by the audio recordings or notation and like uh, conducted in a way. So, and also like normally we do fact check when always when we report, but I can guarantee, but there's a very low uh, habit of fact checking in Sri Lanka. But if you go by the users, users have a very less uh, media literacy, as I told you. Nobody going to fact check and like share anything on Facebook or whatever it is, or WhatsApp. And WhatsApp uh, plays a very major role in spreading this misinformation and very quickly. So I think uh, there should be some like uh, uh, effective measurements uh, where like I don't know how many of you are coming from South Asian background but being a South Asian and how news spread and how the political and the, uh, you know the custom and the cultural environment we are living in. So it's very uh, difficult to handle sometimes. So there's a effective, there should be an effective me me mechanism to counter this, uh, uh, I mean, the misinformation before the mis misinformation become dangerous. And uh, it, it should uh, have implication to change uh, how this mechanism should be addressed in a country like ours where a lot of multi-ethnic and a uh, lot of uh, religions are activated and a lot of languages have been talked where the English is not the major language and where there are a lot of local language. So I think that question is lies within us how to uh, address this and how to effectively address this question. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. We can talk again uh, later also. Thank you, Shara. The reason I wanted to talk about the local case studies uh, from Sri Lanka and Pakistan is generally the solutions that we are uh, that we are very uh, uh, that we are big fans of fact checking solutions. They tend to come from the global north, and they almost always forget to keep the nuances of the global south when developing these solutions. Uh, and so, yeah. Hence, generally, we want to also bring um, a friend from Sri Lanka. And I'm very going, uh, very quickly going to share some facts from Pakistan. And I'm very excited to move on to um, the other panelists. <clears throat> so, we've recently had elections today. Pakistan, uh, uh, I'm sorry, recently had elections um, uh, uh, this year. And Pakistan is a country of about 200 million, about 40 percent people, 35 to 40 percent people connected to internet. There are about 33 million Facebook accounts, and about half of that uh, uh, 30 million are also on Twitter. So before um, elections, we found a lot of political activity on Twitter. And we wanted to see how much of that activity is, uh, is organic, so to speak. Because there were very clear indications that there were supposedly engineered hashtags calling for various actions, often targeting journalists, human rights defenders, and so on. And they were getting really, really popular. Uh, often they would have many, many thousand tweets um, in just a couple of days. And you know, th there, was a, there was a real amount of activity happening online. So what we <clears throat> did was we started this research called Trends Monitor. And the idea was that we, uh, using Twitter APIs, we capture some of that data. And we, through an algorithm, we try and find how many of these political hashtags are actually being contributed to by fake accounts or bots, as we call them, or, or in the research, we call them human bots. Because unlike uh, the spamming bots or unlike the, uh, uh, you know, the, the marketing bots, these fake accounts are manned by humans. And so they're, you know, often one person would be manning like 10, 12, 15, 20, even more than that from one laptop. And it's very easy to do that. Often these accounts are also interoperated by teams in various cities. So you know you'll, you'll often find out that one account is being used to send out tweets as high as uh, using a rate as high as 47 tweets in one minute, and which is not humanly possible, of course. Anyway, so we've in two months we 
captured about 225 political hashtags. This is, these are the hashtags alongside other content which we found political or which were having political um, conversations. In them, there were about 68 million tweets. I would go into the details of the findings of the research. It's, it's an ongoing sort of uh, initiative. It's also online on the website. Uh, so you can say that uh, you can see it, but the crux of this, the idea, of, uh, and which I'm going to share here, we found many fake accounts, and often we found that these political hashtag, most of them, had a huge amount of activity from the human bots, uh, and, and there were various sort of uh, uh, attributes and so on. So I'm, again, I'm not going to go into the detail, but one thing that we found in almost all of the political hashtags was this, these accounts were directly involved in spreading very intelligently made uh, misinformation slash disinformation content. And what they were actively doing was that this content was in Urdu. And in most of the time, Urdu is, by the way, the local language of, uh, in Pakistan. And most of the times, this content would be in the shape of images. So there is no way for Googling it, or there is no way for uh, sort of text searching it online. And then we found out that there is a whole other dimension of the spread of this misinformation content that we are missing. And that is WhatsApp, because there is practically no way of monitoring the content which is going into the private groups on WhatsApp. So that's a whole part of the, the spread that we missed. But even capturing the one medium which is perhaps the least uh, popular in Pakistan, Twitter, popular in terms of numbers uh, of Pakistani accounts, even there we found out that the, the, this, these, these instances of misinformation slash disinformation were rampant. They were completely getting out of control. There's one campaign in particular that I would want to talk about. There was this campaign. So Pakistan is a very politically polarized country, as some of you would know. So there is this campaign uh, going on about uh, asking voters to cross the ballot or cross the, um, uh, the name of the person you don't like on the ballot in addition to the stamp. We don't have e-voting, so we have like manual ballot papers. And you have to stamp the person you are voting for. <laughs> so this campaign was asking people to stamp it, stamp the person you're voting for, and cross the name of the person you don't like. But incidentally, that also cancels the vote, and it doesn't, the vote is it's not counted as, 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 as a, uh, you know, an, uh, in the electoral system. And this is one thing that, which we found going around on Facebook, mainly on Twitter, and I'm quite sure this was going around, which we have no way of finding out. This was going around in WhatsApp group, mainly. There are a lot of, by the way, political, local, community-based WhatsApp group made by colony members and you know, people living in one particular area or city, or even the local political groups and so on. And this was in Urdu. Oftentimes, this was in Sindhi, which is a regional language, local language in Pakistan. Oftentimes, it was in Pushto, which was another local language in, in Pakistan. And so, you know, there was a very concentrated effort, clearly, to make it possible. And as a result, when uh, the voting was done after a, a couple of weeks, we found out the total data, the number of rejected votes, now we don't have any evidence to link it with that, but the number of rejected votes which were, were, were much higher than they were the last time in 2013. You know, so one could argue that that thing could have played the role, but again, we don't have any evidence to link to that, which again is something that we need to work on. Anyway, so th this just a little bit of an idea of what we saw in, in Pakistan through our research. Now this session should have been named uh, misinformation uh, call and debunking solutions because we clearly don't have a solution. And we're only going to talk about what doesn't work. We don't know what works. But we do know what does not work. What doesn't work in Pakistan is this, again, a global north idea of rating outlets. It's very easy to rate outlets on Facebook and consider them or categorize them as a credible slash non-credible or, or trusted outlet slash non-trusted outlet. But the fact of the matter is that when misinformation starts spreading, these so-called quality uh, outlets or quality uh, journalism, uh, journalism content creators, they're often uh, at, at the forefront of making use of that information. They're often reporting them as much as any other fake account. And in fact, they're doing more damage because when they report on something which they have absolutely not verified, 
then they have more of a chance to reaching out their audience instead of fake account, which people have started to know in Pakistan, and I'm sure in other South Asian countries that there are fake accounts available on, on Twitter and Facebook. So that idea of rating outlets, perhaps, is something that we need to uh, sort of rethink. <clears throat> also, it does not work for anything which is being circulated on WhatsApp groups. You, you have absolutely no idea of doing that uh, in any way possible. Another thing, another solution, so-called solution we've seen, is that we, you know, we just simply outsource this content to platform, to outsource censorship to platforms. We write to Facebook to kick in. We write to Twitter to take off a few thousand accounts, and and keep an active eye out, uh, eye out for these these kind of cases. But that doesn't, to me, it and Rosalind pointed out this morning, very uh, summed it up very nicely this morning that what we are doing is we we're outsourcing censorship to a private American company. That's what we are doing, and th that's not what we are doing. That's the government of our countries. That's what they're doing. Um, you know. Frankly speaking, I'm not comfortable with that idea. Also, it doesn't work because, <clears throat> let's face it, how can it, how can, so Twitter, for instance, very recently took out, took off the account of one of the leaders of the protest who I was, who I was talking about in Pakistan leading a very violent protest. That one account was taken off. We monitored, monitored that hashtag campaign that they were running. There were at least 1,000 fake accounts running simultaneously. Promoted the content, promoting the content which that uh, one account was promoting. Uh, so that account was taken off. It's, it's like nothing happens to the campaign. There is absolutely no way of stopping it. So we know that doesn't work. Uh, it, Facebook sponsored fact checking or any fact checking sponsored by an international private company. Well, uh, so in Pakistan, for instance, Facebook has given the task of fact checking to AFP. Which, which is a credible, of course, news agency. What they're doing is they keep an eye out uh, for misinformation content. Of course, they, Facebook um, also uh, shares the content with them. And people can also tag them on Twitter and Facebook pages. But what they do is that they take the Urdu content and they generate misinformation slash fact-checking content in English. And so they're clearly, clearly killing the spirit of fact-checking right there because if you take up a poster which is written in Urdu or another local language, and you're responding in English, a language which 90% of the people perhaps in Pakistan cannot read, and this, you're, not, you're not perhaps doing enough. <clears throat> and like I said, so these are the things we don't know that, we, we clearly know that they don't work. As a journalist, I have to put my faith in, um, of course, two things. One of them generally is credible fact-checking content, which is both in Urdu language, which is somehow also profitable for the media houses, um, and, and for the existing newsroom to, con to create similar content and so on. So there has to be some form of economy in, uh, uh, you know, around fact-checking and so on. Uh, this is the first thing. The second thing, of course, is the media information and literacy. These are the two things that we yet don't, uh, don't know that if they work, because we haven't tried them. Now there are information literacy campaigns starting out in Pakistan. Now there are people like Dawn, for instance. Dawn, is, Dawn happens to be one of the most, uh, one of the leading credible media outlet in Pakistan. It's a huge group. So they're stepping into fact-checking, but even they are in they are doing it in, in English. Nobody's still doing it in Urdu. So yeah, I'll, I'll just stop there. It was just to give a basic picture of how the misinformation content is spreading in Pakistan, which I'm sure pretty much the same in Sri Lanka. So I'll stop here and I'll move to Rosalind, who is from uh, DW Academy. And DW Academy, of, co of course, is one of the institutions also running a, a, a very effective media and information literacy campaign. What I would personally be very interested in knowing about is how has that panned out and what are the lessons learned from that? Um, so, just for those of you who don't know, Deutsche Welle Academy is the media development wing of Deutsche Welle, and Deutsche Welle is the German public broadcaster. Um, Deutsche Welle Academy started working relatively recently on media and information literacy. We've been doing media and information literacy um, projects for about five years which uh, given that we've only started to hear about this topic on a kind of global level, 
it seems that we're a little bit ahead of the game, but uh, the actual kind of field of media education, media literacy has been going on since the 70s. It's not new. Um, media and information literacy is the umbrella term that UNESCO um, developed and it encompasses digital literacy, news literacy, all these different literacies that we're now hearing about actually fit under this media and information literacy umbrella. And what's kind of the point of it or what's important about it is that we always talked about how we needed to read, write and count as our basic literacies in schools and that you had to have to be engaged citizens and now it's felt that in, a di in the world we live in, in an increasingly digitalized world it's also important that you have these skills if you want to be an engaged active citizen and so for us at the academy we embraced the UNESCO uh, definition and and we uh, and we understand that media and information literacy is about developing five core competencies in an individual or in a group and that is that they have access so it's all human rights based in terms of access to information and freedom of expression and so the most important thing first is they have access to information and they know how to access it responsibly that they are able to analyze that information, that they can um, understand media systems, they can recognize disinformation, that they understand and can recognize propaganda. They can also recognize satire. <laughs> so this is important and it's not something that's in education systems everywhere. That they can create their own media so they can voice their opinions and that they can reflect um, knowing and kind of understanding their own rights and also their obligations and they can recognize hate speech, bullying, sextortion and then ultimately what we want is finally that they act and that they can fight for their rights and they you know and this is the five competencies that we are working on in a media and information literacy environment in a media and information literacy project um, themes or thematic issues like disinformation then can fit into this and so what happens is you look at um, a country or area that you're working in and you say okay what are the issues now obviously in today's discussion we're talking about Asia but disinformation um, and hate speech is a pro it seems to be a growing problem everywhere it's not just a problem in Asia in Deutsche Welle Academy we currently have 20 media and information literacy projects across Africa, Asia and Latin America and we are working, we don't have one core um, target group, it's easy for us uh, and it's for most people to reach young people because you can reach them in an institutional setting and they also quite like the idea of creation so there's a definitely a hook that you can get young people on and in most of the countries we work in young people are the majority of the population in uh, Cambodia and in Palestine, we managed to lobby uh, the Ministry of Education and get media and information literacy into the curriculums. So they are now in the curriculums of those countries, which is quite, imp it was before the current uh, changes in Cambodia, which has seen a crackdown on a lot of uh, freedom of expression and um, access to information. But um, it's in the curriculum of the, of the country. And, um, yeah, on a kind of uh, international level, uh, we set up a media and information literacy expert network. And the point of the expert network is to bring experts from across the world working in different approaches. So some of them actually focus on hate speech. Some of them focus on propaganda and uh, misinformation in Georgia. Um, we also work with um, DROG, a Dutch NGO that set up this, uh, I don't know if some of you have heard of it, but this uh, Get Bad News app that went viral about six months ago. And they have a kind of alternative way of kind of getting young people to create bad news in order to learn about the process, in order to be able to recognize it and to see the damage that it can do. Um, and then we also work with um, young journalists 
also because it's kind of assumed that journalists should be media and information literate, that it's part of the professionalization um, of people in the, in the profession, but it's also in, sometimes needed in many of the countries in which we work. Um, for um, on an inter kind of on a European level, media and information literacy has been um, sort of proposed or put forward as as uh, an area to develop by the European Commission. So they had a recent report released in February of this year um, on disinformation. Some of you will be aware of it. And the idea is to strengthen the ability and the um, levels of citizens before looking at regulation. Um, where we've seen regulation, uh, in Kenya, for example, also in Tanzania, and um, I'm not sure what regulation, maybe you can talk about. Um, but from my experience, it's normally led to the crackdown of freedom of expression and a crackdown of jour on journalists. And so um, this is the kind of challenges. Um, definitely, uh, media and information literacy is not the silver bullet. And it's not going to solve the problems that Assad was introducing at the beginning with this uh, really developed, highly um, original looking um, videos of people that have been developed by, by computer programs. Um, no matter how much you, uh, as an individual, are going to look at this content, it looks believable. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, I guess, the biggest uh, challenge. Um, but you can give people um, basic skills and uh, good enough um, critical analysis skills that they um, are know what to look out for. Shall we hand over to um, Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, Eric, what, you know, I was hoping you could perhaps talk a little about on the responses, especially the legislations and policies made, made around as we call it, uh, or as they call it, fake news, and how useful they are, and what, what are the chances of them being used as tools to suppress dissent or target journalists and journalists? Sure. So um, our um, angle on this issue is, uh, relates to, at the moment, in relation to fake news and false news, uh, challenging legislation that introduces provisions that seeks to regulate um, fake news, false news, and a range of other um, issues uh, relating to uh, the cyber world. So you see a proliferation in the last number of years of legislation mm -hmm. in various jurisdictions relating to what's referred to as preventing electronic crimes or cyber crime acts, where they contain some very problematic provisions from our perspective, which will have a serious impact on, on freedom of expression. And our approach is that um, there are certain well-established fundamental freedom of expression principles in the human rights world which need to be complied with and when there's a failure to do so um, those legislative provisions um, should be shut down i mean one of the the starting point in a way for us when when this type of legislation is is introduced is that we see a almost a malign intent on the part of governments to to regulate and to suppress and to manipulate and to prevent people from critiquing or, or um, exposing corruption or exposing incompetence um, in governments and among non-state actors. And our, um, our involvement then uh, is to engage with local lawyers to assist local lawyers in bringing challenges to this type of legislation. So this proliferation of legislation is quite interesting because a lot of this legislation contains um, across jurisdictions contain, contains very similar provisions, uh, strikingly similar provisions, almost like there's a playbook from, from one, uh, one state that's introduced this law that is then copied by other states who introduce um, legislation that is framed in almost exactly uh, the same terms, which is a, is a problem because the legislation that we've been challenging recently is usually vague and overbroad in the sense that it doesn't comply with well-established international freedom of expression standards. Um, there, are, there is what they call the three-part test when it comes to freedom of expression. You have it, uh, any restriction on freedom of expression must be provided by law, it must pursue a legitimate aim, and it must be necessary in a democratic society. And when you apply that test 
to this um, legislation, it falls down on almost every level. And that's a cumulative test. All of those um, um, limbs of the three-part test must be must be met, must be complied with. So uh, to, today, um, we've just recently been working on a, um, a challenge to the uh, the law in Tanzania, the cyber crimes law in Tanzania, and today it's in court before the East African Court of Justice, where um, sections 50 and 54 of that uh, act are being challenged, and they talk about false news um, and false news that has the effect of upsetting or offending people. And one of the fundamental principles of um, freedom of international freedom of expression law is that there is a right to offend, to shock, and to disturb. So this loosely framed legislation is problematic. Um, and is already being implemented in order to suppress journalists who are seeking to, to talk about corruption or talk about incompetence and so on um, among state actors and, and people connected to the state. So um, it's a proliferation. Um, in Kenya, there's an ongoing challenge which is um, going to the Supreme Court, which seeks to challenge the Cyber Crimes Act. There's also a case before the, the Court of Appeal in, in Nigeria as as well. And in Pakistan, the Prevention of, Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act is currently being challenged before, um, before the High Court in is Islamabad. Um, and we've been working on all of those cases and we can see the commonalities that exist and we've been providing uh, or working with the lawyers to, to kind of construct arguments which challenge the vagueness and the arbitrariness of those laws, but also to challenge the fact that those legislative uh, provisions give um, give a lot of leeway to to the government to implement them. So there is a, a the discretion that the government has in the way in which it uses those um, those laws. We say is is contrary to to, to international um, international law. The other thing we notice with these kinds of legislative provisions is that there's a lot of similarities to legislation that was introduced during the during the war on terror. So from 2001 onwards, um, national security laws were being introduced, again vague, <coughs> overbroad, um, subject to um, arbitrary interpretation by the government in a way that would allow them to, uh, to circumvent what, are, what would have been well-established um, human rights defences. So for example, in relation to the war on terror, you had legislation that allowed for extended periods of detention without access to, to a lawyer. You don't have the, the same extreme type of provision within um, this kind of cybercrime legislation, but you do have this loose language that suggests that um, it's only a matter of time before governments begin to copy each other and to, uh, to, to implement these provisions in a way that will will have a serious impact on human rights defenders, on bloggers, on journalists, um, uh, and so on. Um, in Kenya, for example, uh, we're representing a journalist who's already been arrested twice um, and detained once in relation to tweets that he, he's put out and he's been charged under their uh, cybercrime laws. Um, and the allegation is that he, uh, well, the allegation is as yet unknown, and that's one of the, the limbs of the challenge that we're bringing, but the suggestion is that he's being picked up on the basis that he's disseminating news that they will subsequently claim to be false news under the Cyber Crimes, uh, the, the Cyber Crimes Act. So among the kind of freedom of expression legal fraternity, there is this instinctive reaction every time legislation is introduced that seeks to regulate speech. Um, but this is a difficult one, I think, for, for, um, for freedom of expression lawyers because the understanding is that freedom of expression, and you'll see this in all of the, the jurisprudence from all of the major courts around the world, they often open with this statement that freedom of expression underpins a democratic society. Um, but then, of course, if you have this, um, these problematic um, false dissemination, disinformation, um, proliferation going on, you have to wonder whether that in itself under, undermines um, uh, democracy. So the, the instinctive reaction is the, the challenge to these types of laws, and there's some really interesting commentary from the UN Special Rapporteurs on freedom of expression who are talking about the negative impact that, 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 um, that these kinds of laws will have on, um, on freedom of expression. But the problem is they don't necessarily offer very concrete solutions, just some, some suggestions, like as I mentioned earlier on, around um, fact-checking and, uh, and this, this, kind of, um, this kind of approach. There's also a very American um, reaction to this 
this kind of law, certainly from the legal fraternity, which would be challenging bad speech with more speech. So this idea of maximalization of, of speech, which um, may, or, may or may not work, but studies suggest that fake speech, hate speech in uh, certain instances can be more effective in the way in which it um, infiltrates um, uh, society in the way in which it's um, it's shared uh, among among communities. So it's it's difficult to to, to to know precisely how to counteract it. But uh, one of the concerns we have is that regulation will not necessarily be the appropriate avenue to to go down, primarily because it allows for um, potential abuse by governments. Um, and that abuse may ultimately result in the suppression of critical thinking, the suppression of, of uh, investigative journalism, for example, which is one of the key areas we, we, um, we litigate on and, and uh, work in. Um, so as with the other speakers, I, I think it's difficult to, to suggest a, a silver bullet and to say here is a solution, but certainly you can be uh, vigilant as to perhaps dangerous outcomes in the efforts to seek a remedy to or a solution to uh, to the kind of this ongoing hate uh, f uh, f um, uh, fake news false news dilemma one of those being that the introduction of of these kinds of laws is um, is extremely problematic um, thank you I think we'll stop here and we'll uh, open the floor for open discussions feedback comments questions um, anything that you want to offer? <clears throat> Hi, uh, I'm Ali from Morocco. I I'll make your feedback, please, as uh, a journalist and uh, uh, press freedom uh, defenders. Uh, your feedback about what uh, Mr. M President Macron said uh, about the initiative of Reporters Without Borders. Um, uh, I think the idea is, is to establish a, a trusted uh, third party uh, to validate the, the, the information. Uh, so what you're feeling, is it something which could block or disrupt the freedom of uh, press or is it something that can reinforce the, the journalism in general? Thanks. Should I respond? Or? Okay. Uh, I think it depends. Look, one thing that we've learned, and we've learned it the hard way, that there is no one, uh, one size fits all solution to this problem. Uh, and, and like I said, there might be this tendency, of, you know, e even um, in a lot of us coming from uh, Asian and uh, you know, South American countries and so on. Uh, to believe that this might be the possibility and this might be like a potential solution, but there really isn't a way to believe that because we've seen, like um, uh, uh, Frederick said, that uh, we've seen these solutions fail. Uh, we've seen these promises fail. Uh, so unless there is a way to, how should I say, balance it in one way or another, it's very difficult to say. But one thing that we do know is that most governments in the global south have a very elaborate and very sort of colorful track record of using whatever laws and policies there are in place for protection in their own favor, in their own political uh, sort of uh, point scoring. In the very law that Frederick was mentioning about, and there is a, like this whole irony, and I'm going to take actually a minute and share that irony with you. There's this whole irony around this Cyber Crimes Law, as we call it in Pakistan, it's, uh, it is a longish name, Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act. The government who drafted this bill, uh, who drafted this legislation, had a protest of another political party in mind. They took up uh, roads in, in, in the red zone, as we call it, in front of the Parliament House, sat there for about 100 days. And they made a lot of noise online, on Twitter, and so on. So the government of that time, which was the uh, 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 Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz government, they drafted this law thinking about that protest. And the irony was that after a couple of years, the same law was basically used to arrest their own political activists, the very people who drafted the law. And another irony was that the people who were opposing the same law are using pretty much the same kind of, uh, uh, using it, the same gimmicks and same objectives in mind, using the same law for what they were 
protesting against and for what they were criticizing the other government for. So you see, you know, these are the things that at least I have to keep in mind whenever I think about a solution like this, for instance. Hi, I'm Marta Roldos from Ecuador, South America. Um, in Ecuador and in all the, the region that uh, we had the so-called uh, 20th century one socialism, we are, really, we are really afraid of laws because every law has been written to suppress dissent. In Venezuela, they, had, they have a hate speech law that actually puts in jail for up to 20 years people who, uh, according to the judges, uh, did hate speech because they criticized any government figure. So that's hate speech for them. You cannot hate them because they are corrupt. You cannot hate them because they are violating human rights. So if you hate them for that and criticize them, you are going to go to jail because you had hate speech. So we are really, we are really afraid of that kind of laws. When I, I used to oppose to any kind of control of internet, uh, but when I hear cases of, as, as we have heard from Southeast Asia, where misinformation can be used to target people to be killed, we think that there should be some kind of balance. When you come from South, uh, Latin America, South America, we don't have that kind of problem. Our problem is that the ones who spread misinformation, the ones who uh, contract uh, troll centers, troll factories, and all that are governments. And then after that, governments blame the press, and then they say that they have to control misinformation and fake news and do uh, very stern laws to control the things that they provoked, that they did. So uh, I don't know what's the middle ground in this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just a bit of that, but I don't think, or we don't believe, at least in Ecuador, we don't believe it's laws, because at least we, could be, we were able to denounce corruption through the internet because it was like the last frontier for investigative journalists in Ecuador. The internet was the last frontier. We, we even have problems in the internet because uh, the government copyrighted the logo of public documents and then you cannot publish the documents, public documents because the logo was, was a trademark and even the American sites take down our information in order in, to infringe copyright law. And then if you publish the same document without the logo, it was fake news. So I don't have an answer for that, but I'm, I'm really scared about what you told about artificial intelligence, because if they, we don't, we are the ones who never had the resources. They are the ones who always have the resources, even to make a fake video. So I don't know how to, I don't, I don't have answers either. I, I'm, I'm afraid of that kind of things. We are, we are now we are seeing something, not quite um, Asia, but we are seeing something uh, from the religious religious uh, extremists, Catholic and Protestant religious extremists, saying like Pizza Hut is undermining undermining family values because they were having some messages that were inclusive for LGBT people, and that the, a law trying to uh, teach sexual education for kids was to, co to, co to, to, to turn every kid into a homosexual. And they are quite effective, and we are seeing that, but it's not political, it has another, another source, and it runs mostly not through Twitter or Facebook, it runs through WhatsApp. And you cannot do that because you know churches have been doing that for centuries. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, good afternoon everyone. What I wanted to say is a kind of follow up or to put a question in this way. Is it okay to prepare for regulation because the way things are going, I think one way or other, at different levels, we 
are going to eventually have regulations. She was talking about um, our country. In my country, we have a hate speech bill that has been introduced by the executive uh, into the House. And when the executive introduces a bill, it's a very dangerous thing. It's a it's hate speech bill and ha has up to penalty of death sentence. Yes, in Nigeria, yes, she's talking about 20 years of jail. There's death sentence in this bill for hate speech. So, uh, and the argument for this, usually for hate speech, for fake news, we know it's some sort of control of flow of information and crackdown on dissenting voices, but the argument is usually the things that are happening, um, you know, around communal clashes, tri tribal and religious, um, and ethnic wars, you know, that are, that are being blamed. Um, and I'm seeing that the trend is not unique to Nigeria or to Africa. It's, you know, like uh, the panelists have talked about, it's happening all over the world. And somewhere I see regulation coming, and there's a strong argument for it, and I'm thinking that should we be preparing uh, as stakeholders for these kinds of regulation and what, how sh how, what is the best way to engage when these regulations come? Uh, hi, uh, Lucas from Brazil, Civil Society. Um, I think Brazilian elections and its relationship with WhatsApp uh, was, is still a big case study for other countries to take part in. Um, as civil society, a member of academia, it was really hard to analyze the actual reach of fake news through WhatsApp. Um, I have colleagues, political analysts, that actually infiltrated some of the groups that were spreading fake news. Uh, but there are so many ethical issues reporting on that, especially because there's no content from uh, all the members of those groups. So you actually have the information, you have uh, frequent users that have been disseminating fake news, but you can't really publish a report with their names and numbers. Um, but you see some of the methods they use to, to spread their news. Um, so. I would like to share that frustration. Uh, it's really hard to even report on what's going on through WhatsApp. But there are ways in which you can uh, look into the problem uh, indirectly, like even the way Facebook tried to deal with the situation in Brazil, shutting down accounts that were spamming too much content without actually uh, realizing or uh, checking the actual content of the, the account itself. Uh, on, on, on WhatsApp. And also, uh, with regard to should we regulate, should we not regulate, I know it depends on each country's traditional uh, legislation and uh, judicial account, uh, but at least for Brazilian purposes, I think it, uh, an ideal mix uh, would be a balance between judicial oversight but also civil society and, and some of the uh, of our partners and uh, private entities, because there's no way uh, just uh, trusting entrusting the private system, the uh, service providers uh, to do that for for themselves, or even uh, letting it all rest on judges' hands or politicians to to make laws regarding hate speech. There needs to be some sort of combination, either by participating in lobbying strategies for lob, uh, lawmakers or even uh, direct contact between private entities and civil society. Thank you. Something about the hate speech in Nigeria? Um, so, I mean, it's uh, freedom of expression is not an absolute right. So, hate speech is recognized as one of the restrictions that can be imposed, and it's perfectly appropriate to impose um, legislation that, that um, prevents that from happening. Um, but then the question becomes whether you can, you can criminalize it, first of all, and secondly, how has that legislation come into being? Has it been an appropriate consultation process? Uh, have stakeholders from various areas of expertise been involved in, in putting that together? I think that's the essential question, how specific is the legislation in terms of its content such that it cannot be open to arbitrary application or uh, abuse and so on. Um, so uh, when you're talking about imposing the death penalty, that raises all kinds of you know, human rights uh, issues above and beyond uh, the, the restriction on, on hate speech. But yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, it, if you're, the starting point for the government is its intention to introduce this legislation in order to you know to 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 suppress um free expression and so on then you're 
then you're off to a very bad start and it's only going to be a bad piece of legislation. As to what you can do, I mean, there are a number of challenges. One of the, the lawyers who's, who's not in the room, but he's here, we're working with him on challenging the cyber crimes case in, in, in Nigeria. So, I mean, it's a question of testing the constitutionality of the provisions before the courts and seeing whether those courts um, taking into account international and comparative uh, legal standards, whether those courts find that it's um, consistent with the, with the Constitution. I was just going to kind of add to that in terms of the question of do we foresee more regulation? And unfortunately, from the discussions that I've been party to, yes. Uh, I already heard that the Brits will release a white paper soon and this is something to expect. And then we have to look at, okay, as civil society actors, how do you advocate, how do you come together in Nigeria, for example, to really um, raise awareness and you know, be part of uh, advocacy and policy um, influencing. Um, uh, yes, Mark. I would just add that, you know, the, looking across the different measures that have been taken against different kinds of um, media laws and other provisions that countries have made over the years, what we've seen in, in the studies that have been done of this is that really strong coalitions of civil society and media actors and different players in the system are the way to go. It's much better to try to build a movement of, of concerned actors and not to try to do this as just the media or just you know, one civil society organization, but to try to build broader groups to generate conversation and debate about the provisions that I think really are coming. We, and many people feel that some of this stuff is, is needed. But the, um, the real thing is to have people like yourselves in the room along with other players. And I think Latin America is a good example of where that has happened. You know, the use of the, uh, the uh, different uh, multilateral institutions, the Latin, the Latin American system and on human rights, uh, has been an effective instrument for generating those debates. Um, Africa has used this to some extent, but it could do more on that front. Uh, the, um, and the, the, the scholarship on this, the different things that have been written about media reform laws, really comes to the conclusion that it really requires a broad, a broad coalition, and including groups that may not naturally always come together, like women's groups and child protection groups and uh, people who have diverse interests, you know, LGBT groups that, uh, that may uh, eventually have some voice in reali realizing that we need freedom of expression and freedom of assembly and an open and, and a, a, a very high quality press in order for us to survive in our, our work. So we need to get active in bringing these groups together and creating these coalitions and creating movements because we can't do it alone and in silos. I agree with you, Mark, and like uh, coming back to the point you made from Nigeria, from perspective of what happened in the recent past in Sri Lanka, like I had the same fear, like I think for Sri Lanka regulation is a mere reality. I mean, it's the reality coming forward. Uh, you know, with the recent uh, violence happened, which is which mirrors certain things same as what happened in Myanmar, that uh, the violence projected on online, which uh, may uh, which uh, direct to the offline spaces and like damage a lot of people. So. In, the, in that status where the emergency status was there and like curfew was there and seven days blockage of social media apps by the government. The government thought that it was the best uh, decision to take while, the, uh, the, while these uh, viola violations were going on. So there's a risk that government is always trying, which is the easiest and which is the, uh, which is the easiest way to control. So I think in our country, and like we, we have this fear that they are going to consult China on social media behavior, which is very fearful. So like we have a fear that regulations are coming 
and for Sri Lanka, I feel like it's very near. And also, like uh, the coming on the fake news and misinformation, the problem we also have is like with the national nationalistic approaches and the anti-communal uh, attitudes we are growing on. People tend to believe the misinformation as the true information because they are biased. So there is a problem how to convince that this is fake and this is misinformation. There's a problem like that in Sri Lanka because most people, are like half of the people in the country, want it to be like Sinhala only. So they tend to believe it like this misinformation as true information because uh, for their own advantage. So for civil society or the other groups, it's very hard to fight against because then again, we are uh, getting the argument that you are founded and you, are, you have agendas, you are coming from America, you are NGOs, that kind of attitude. Because always the nationalistic uh, approach or that idea goes into people. So there is that problem also, the attitudinal change uh, is a must, I guess. Because otherwise, like, however we uh, initiate counter programs to uh, like eradicate disinformation or misinformation, people doesn't want to believe it as true information. Because they tend to see the misinformation as the true information. Because, you know, like, we, we have this uh, critical issue in Sri Lanka, like sterilization pills. I don't know where they are is in the world, but you know, like th there is a rumor going on that Muslims are spreading sterilization pills to increase, I mean, to decrease uh, Sinhalese population to a population and to increase Muslim population in the country. So these kind of ideas are like, you know, they are uh, gone inside people and they tend to believe it. So they don't want to fact check or to go and see what is accurate, what is not accurate. They just believe it. And this has uh, like gone to the ground and it has created violent on ground, which has on the online spaces and state media and the press is like, you know, if you take about the LGBT, it's also true. Like marginalized communities are always being marginalized by the state uh, and the press and they are, they are being used at you know, like for their advantage. So I see a risk of regulations coming to Sri Lanka because, uh, yeah, there's an attitudinal problem as well for missing, because people tend to, as I told you before, people tend to believe misinformation as the true information. Which I would quickly mention before um, um, going to anybody else who has something to say is one um, which my colleague from Brazil mentioned so that uh, the oversight in one way or another, I'm not talking specifically about judicial oversight, but the oversight of the civil society. And other which Mark mentioned, the, uh, the need for strong coalitions, not just of uh, uh, like-minded groups, but groups who are perhaps not present in this room or generally are not present in, on the table when uh, discussions like this are happening. This is something I've realized as well, that most of the digital rights conversations we have are in isolation. Most of the rights-based ideals that we discuss are with friends, people who are already converted. We actually are not really, or at least I'm saying it for myself, we are not trying to reach out to people who needs to be a, a part of that discussion. <clears throat> the reason we are, uh, like she said, so scared of regulation and newer regulations coming on on a daily basis are, is, is the fact that because we're living in societies which, has, uh, which, which have been oppressed for, for nearly half a century now, perhaps more than that. We're living in, a com in communities where people think that the regulations are good for them, that the state imposed laws which often stands to curtail their free expression and other fundamental rights are in fact for their own protection. This is what the people believe. And because when resistance comes for these uh, regulations, for instance, the law that uh, Patrick was talking about, we often found only f maybe five or 10 or 15 or 20 people standing with us in a protest when we are talking about that. This, is, this, this narrative, this dialogue is not something that the majority of our, at least our people subscribe to. Because they, they, this idea of state giving them protection is so enshrined into their basic uh, philosophies and their, their lifestyles that even if there is a law which is to 
uh, uh, which is to make it mandatory to install a government monitored camera in their houses, they'll be perfectly fine with it, thinking that this is for our own protection. This is what we are dealing with. And so hence, we're, we're very scared of it. Uh, and one of the examples, then um, this might be an interesting story for all, all of you here. One of the examples that we have from, uh, uh, from my country is that uh, there are some FATF. So Pakistan was recently put in the FATF gray list. And uh, there were some guidelines given to Pakistan uh, about, uh, um, about uh, doing something about the money laundering. And, uh, and, and similar issues. Speci and that, by the way, is speci specifically uh, related to uh, uh, the, the money laundering done by a lot of not-for-profit groups. Now, generally, when I say not-for-profit groups, you might think of NGOs working for civil, liberty, uh, civil liberties and rights and so on. But in Pakistan, many of the religious groups who might have uh, or potentially have connections with terrorist groups are also registered as not-for-profits. I'm not sure about what's happening to them, but I do know that uh, NGOs, for instance, like ours, are uh, getting the brand of it, brunt of it. And so these are the kind of things that I'm talking about needs uh, civil society um, oversight or, or oversight in general of how those regulations are being implemented uh, and so on. Yeah, I think I'm talking too much. I'll stop here. And Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Tanya. I work in uh, Serbia for Balkan Investigative Reporting Network. I was just trying, I will just try to contribute to this very interesting conversation. I think that we actually have to consider several parallel tracks or processes that we need to work in uh, unless we are trying to somehow give uh, uh, our response to, to spread of this information and their uh, negative impact. One is actually we need to work uh, on technical aspect. We need to understand how the uh, social media AIs are working, how the content moderation is being done, how, what is the technical aspect of, uh, uh, that actually enables uh, this, uh, this information being spread. Another aspect that we need to work on is actually we need to work with people and this is where the uh, MIL and similar courses are actually quite uh, quite interesting to me and I think this is like a way forward. I know it's not panacea and it won't and it will require several years of engagement but I think it's it's going to be important especially if we can include various stakeholders or various groups in our societies to embrace this concept not to say that internet is all bad but re let's reclaim it as uh, our uh, mean to be uh, creative as our mean to be free and uh, uh, our mean to be uh, also responsible uh, uh, and also I think that MIL should uh, recognize journalists more because they also need to be capacitated and their skills need to be uh, upgraded and especially uh, in terms of uh, professional and ethical standards that they should uh, obey because this is one of the ways to, uh, to fight the disinformation. Uh, legislation of course is also uh, uh, one of the ways, and I, I'm not going to repeat everything that you said so far. I think that's pretty clear. And also what we need to uh, consider, and which is like super complex issue, is actually the content itself and the context in which it, it's, it's been made. Because sometimes we're facing such gray zones uh, in where, the, where does the content stop being professional and ethical, and how does it slip into uh, hate speech or, or, or disinformation and I think that's going to be like, like really really important um, and uh, I say quite complex issue uh, that we need thoroughly to discuss it's like example by example and, uh, and the cases that you've been showing us and demonstrating us from Pakistan to Sri Lanka and such are actually showing us that we really need to understand the, the context uh, where the, the information is, is coming from and how is it created and what's the, the final aim of this uh, information, what's its, what's its purpose. So that's it for me. 
Hi, um, my question is to you, the panelists. Um, you know, why now we are talking about how to counter uh, disinformation, fake news uh, online. And then my question here is, um, you know, on the other hand, how we can stop, you can stop the government's framing, uh, you know, uh, there is a lot of, you know, fake news online. Seems like there is one, you know, uh, problem, one person, a problem, you know, uh, social media content is fake news, but government is, government is other people, are, you know, lying to make people believe that you know there is a 10 or 20 percent of fake news online I came from Myanmar so what happened in my country is like uh, what she said and also you know government is trying to um, regulate uh, on their own so you know they have already uh, introduced and established a social media monitoring teams so that you know uh, they can monitor fake news and also hate speech online and that they're gonna punish on their own so you know in that sense we really scared and we really worry that you know how government will frame on um, you know disinformation and then you know uh, maybe you know they can over you know uh, overreact uh, they can overreact and also you know they can frame like you know it is more than, you know, um, um, content, uh, social media content, you know, it is uh, disinformation and, you know, uh, hate speech and then the real uh, reality. We should wrap up a little early. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, honestly, I was thinking because it's the last session and uh, because we, most of us are very tired at this point. Uh, so we might not have a lot of people, but thank you so much uh, for participating and especially uh, for the feedback and your uh, recommendations. Like I said, for, for my personal interest, uh, you know, I wanted to see what are those solutions which have not worked, what, what are those uh, 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 you know, binary models that we pin our hope on, and most of the governments also pin their hopes on, and how are they failing, uh, Waldo? I, th I think we have pretty much, uh, pretty great information on that front. So with that, thank you so much, and uh, we'll hopefully see each other very, uh, uh, very soon again, uh, even before IGF. But one thing that I would like to sort of request, uh, the journalists here, people who are associated with the media, <clears throat> this is something that we've learned the hard way again in Pakistan, that unless there is some form of a personal commitment to fact-checking on social media platforms, this, this, it doesn't work. This is, this is a request that I make usually to all my colleagues, friends, people who I work with, uh, people who I'm associated with back home, that whenever you can on social media platforms, if you have the information, if you have the influence, if you have the resource, try and fact check whatever misinformation, disinformation content that you come up with. This can literally save lives. We've seen that happening in, in, in countries like Pakistan, India, I'm sure. Uh, and, and this is something which is extremely important for us. So if, if, if you're a journalist, if you come up with or come across with anything that you have more information on, you can contribute on, please do that. Thank you. <laughs>